Okay, we are back again for another episode of Perspective on Athletics. Today we have Bill Hogan, and Bill's the Director of Athletics at Seattle University. Bill, thanks for taking time and joining us today. Hey, Mark, it's good to be with you, and I look forward to this conversation. It's my first time uh, dealing with this type of situation, but but it should be fun. We will be gentle. Uh, don't worry there. But <laughs> hey, I've this heard is that before. yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> right. Well, this is going to be great. We're going to talk about some interesting things that you've developed over the course of your career. But before we get to that, we want to help people understand a little bit more about you and your background. So, could you give us kind of a brief career sketch of the stops along the way and how you ended up at Seattle U? I started as a college basketball player back at St. Joe of Indiana, Division II school. Loved it. Had a, a really good playing career there. And then uh, wanted to coach and started in high school in Ohio and did that for a few years. Uh, wanted to try the college uh, the opportunity and, and ran into my former coach at St. Joe. He's a head coach at Bowling Green. Went to Bowling Green for, uh, ended up being four years in graduate school and Finished the master's and a PhD there, and then thought I'd try the administration and coaching. So I went back to St. Joseph College. It was there for 10 years. I enjoyed that a lot. I will admit, as a coach, I didn't quite handle the three-point shot and the shot clock as well as you might expect. So, I, But I think I was kind of leaning towards getting more in administration and had a great opportunity at the University of San Francisco. Went there in 91 and stayed there for 15 years. Really loved it there. It was a great Jesuit school. And I uh, had a couple really, really phenomenal years there. And then uh, was contacted by a search firm, actually it's a couple search firm, but uh, one was a friend of mine and uh, Betsy Alden, and she talked about this opportunity in Seattle. And I've only been to Seattle one other time and I didn't know much about it. And the, the chair of the committee called me and says, uh, this is a Midwest city on the West Coast. I go, no such thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so I came up for a visit and really uh, got caught up in the in the whole challenge of being the only school to ever return to Division One in the, the way that we did. So that sort of was was um, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It's something that takes a lot of. Um, uh, you have to persevere through some things, but I also thought it'd be very re rewarding, which it has been. So I've been here for, for eight years now and, and love it. And uh, we're full back Division One now after 33 years. Everybody remembers Elgin Baylor. He's uh, been a great supporter of ours, but that was in 1958 when they played Kentucky for the national championship. So we're, our goal is to get back to those, those glory days. Yeah. Well, it has been a great run for you, and you certainly have been uh, various places across the country. I remember your time down at USF. I was in the mm -hmm. Bay Area at the time, and you guys had some great programs up there. And the Seattle U thing is very interesting. And like I say, after 30-some years of not being in Division One, the decision was made that that's where Seattle U belongs, and you were a part of that. You've been orchestrating that whole move. What, what went into that discussion and decision-making process, and why was that the right place? for Seattle U? I think the primary issue is Division One is a important platform for uh, messaging your university. We call it the front porch. Mm -hmm. Athletics is the front porch of the university. We have this phenomenal, great Jesuit education here. Uh, we, we lead the community, but so many people outside of the Northwest were not aware of Seattle University. Mm -hmm. So by going back to Division One, we think it enhanced our visibility considerably. It connected us with our alumni base, which is about uh, I think 40 or 50,000 now. It just made a huge difference in how our, our university is perceived. And we've, we've enjoyed it now. It's, it's difficult. Back before 2002, it was a two year process when you went from Division II to Division I. Now it's a five year process. And during those five years, you are not eligible for any NCAA tournaments in any sport. And that makes a very difficult recruiting. Uh, a component. So we've we had to deal with that, and I and I, I do. If I go on my uh, my soapbox for a minute, I, I do feel like that really impacts the student athletes. That those young people, they're part of the NCAA. They, they deserve a shot at, at being eligible for the NCAA tournament. Now, if we make it, great. If we don't make it, at least we have that opportunity. So, but I think overall, that the university saw this as a way to enhance the 
the perception of being uh, being a, a prestigious university. So that's gone really well. And I think that's great. And I know that you're very concerned and do a great job on the academic side with your student <laughs> athletes. But some might be concerned that Division One uh, maybe takes away from the academic environment, particularly for the student athletes. How have you maintained that as a priority, and has that uh, has that remained constant with the move to Division One for your student athletes? You sound like my arts and sciences faculty here. <laughs> Please but don't they, say that. <laughs> they, you know, the good, good part about Seattle University, I think, is they they sort of drill us on what's expected, and you, there's no shortcuts. That's the biggest thing. Uh, our academic profile of the student that comes to Seattle University has gone up. For example, uh, all those all those things that you can statistically prove are have improved. But one thing that's really interesting is that before we went to Division One, about sixty percent of our student population was from the state of Washington. Since we went to Division One, over sixty percent are from outside the state of Washington. And here's what's really interesting: when we joined the WAC. Uh, there's like seven seven states within the WAC represented in that first year that were from uh, parts of the country that did not have a single Division One Catholic university in, like uh, Colorado, Texas, uh-huh. uh, New Mexico, et cetera. So what we've been able to do is we've connected a lot with with those those folks, and it's it's been good advertising and good uh, good opportunity for students to matriculate here. Yeah. Well, it certainly seems to have been a great move, and you found a conference home, and you're competing for championships now, and you've made some great hires, I know, so it seems like definitely uh, things are moving in the right direction. Now, I know in the past you have been a professor as well. Are you doing any teaching currently? I was a tenure professor two jobs ago back at St. Joseph College, and I gave up tenure for some reason. That, that seemed like, a, as I get older, I think it's like a really dumb thing to do, but uh, I have always enjoyed teaching, and I've primary marketing and management, and I, I really, uh, I, uh, when I went to USF, I taught in the MBA program, the sports master's program, and the undergraduate business program, and I enjoyed that there. Then when I moved here to Seattle, I taught both MBA classes and undergraduate business and in the sports leadership program here as well. That's a master's program. I haven't done as much lately just because it, it's, things are pretty busy, but I, I, I really enjoy the teaching component. So, Bill, I imagine that uh, with your background teaching and your advanced degrees, that, that helps with faculty in some ways because you might carry a little more credibility. I, I hope so, and um, I do think that faculty in general are, are a little surprised when they, when they learn of my academic background, especially being a tenured professor of business. Uh, most of them, I think, that there's a, there's a correlation between being in athletics and being involved in, in the health exercise or physical education program or coaching background all solely. But I, I will say that I've been very, very fortunate in my career, 33 years as a director of athletics, and I'm, I'm pretty certain about this, probably like a 94, 95% net graduation rate, what they call the GSR. And uh, it's that being around student athletes of that high caliber academically has just been remarkable. I think we had 181 all-conference performers this year. We had three academic All-Americans in soccer. It's just, it's been phenomenal. And that, by the way, the three academic All-Americans in women's soccer were more than any other university in Division One. So we were, we were thrilled with those kinds of accomplishments. And uh, that's continued and actually it's probably gotten a little stronger, I think, over the years since we back, went back to Division One. So it's been since 1980 for the university, and there, there are still a few professors here that were, at, that were teaching at Seattle University at that time, and they remind me regularly about the you know, making sure we do it the right way, and we, we're, we're committed to that. Well, it seems like it's been a great move, and things are going well, so congratulations on orchestrating that whole effort. I, I want to transition now. I think, you know, maybe this ties into your teaching background a little bit, but I've been aware for some time, and we've chatted briefly about your theories on coaches mm-hmm. and, and how they develop and coaching types, and, and I know you've probably done numerous presentations, and you might incorporate this into courses that you've taught in the past, but I wanted to talk about this. You, you've developed this theory about coaches, and you've called it Co- Hogan's coaching dynamics uh, what what is this all about and where did this come from uh, it started in I was teaching an MBA class in the management level and I just got caught up in this whole notion that uh, about 60 percent of our personality is genetic uh, maybe more than that that was by Newsweek magazine study years and years and years ago and I thought to myself probably the thing that happens most frequently for coaches who don't do well 
is I don't know if they, they recognize their own type of personality. So basically, it goes into four categories. Uh, I would say the first one is the driver. That's the Vince Lombardi, the coach Bob Knight, uh, people who are very, very um, uh, ri- uh, disciplinary and strong disciplinary, defense-oriented. Uh, they tend to make the whole greater than some of the parts. Uh, they, they're not necessarily a, a great attractor of talent. They tend to mold their team into their image, uh, but they're strong, uh, strong, strong personalities and very passionate, very driven. The second category are what I would call calculating. And these are uh, sort of unemotional, uh, cerebral, uh, Tom Landry, uh, Bill Walsh, uh, Tom Osborne from Nebraska. I, I used to use this um, line when, uh, when you watch Tom Osborne lose the national championship game on a two-point missed conversion. He has no reaction whatsoever, and I think two years later, he won the national championship on the last play of the game, and still no reaction. But that's that's the the unemotional, cerebral. Uh, they always seem to be very courteous. They they're, they're tremendous at being at remembering names and being very polite. The third category was the marketing group, and I put uh, my old friend Rick Patino in this group, and John Calipari, who I. I was involved with down in Puerto Rico where I used to run the Puerto Rico tournaments and and just uh, very much kind of a, a, a salesperson uh, uh, passionate uh, positive thinking uh, the one thing I have noticed about uh, the what I call the the marketing type coach is they have a bit of a savior mentality so that person likes to go into a situation that's at the bottom and and then and then, and then save it technically they kind of save it and once they're finished saving it though Rather than maintaining that, they tend to go try to find something else to save. So you, about seven years, you, you tend to see movement in that, in that particular type of personality. Then the fourth one is the empower, who's basically like an older brother or friend of the players. And Jerry Tarkanian and Phil Jackson from the later years, those were typical of empowers where they tend to really attract talent because the most talented people in any profession really don't want a whole lot of supervision. So, so the, the, empower, the Empower has a, a unique opportunity to really attract, and they're, they're pretty um, easy going, uh, not a whole, day, a whole lot of yelling or screaming. In particular, uh, one quote I hear all the time about Sparky Anderson, uh, the old Cincinnati Reds baseball manager, he would never embarrass a player publicly. And that's kind of what that, that particular style is. So what I found in, in reviewing it, I read a lot of books and had a lot of uh, opportunities to, um, uh, to just kind of develop my own theories. I found that in my own career, the coaches who failed the most were normally those who did not know their own personality. One day they're, they're Dean Smith, the next day they're Mike Krzyzewski, and, and then after that they become uh, Vince Lombardi. So I've noticed that if there's all kinds of ways to win, uh, the coach needs to look in the mirror and, and sort of understand what his God-given talents are, what his personality is already, admit the strengths and weaknesses of that particular uh, personality. Then the person sitting next to him, the, the assistant coach, has to be the compliment. And I've said this over and over again. I think the first thing that really good coaches do and – to be productive, they, they choose outstanding assistant coaches and staff that complement them. Yeah. So it's very interesting, Bill. Obviously, years of observation and experience, you can see how this actually does play out with different personality types. Mm-hmm. And like you just mentioned, I think as long as people can understand who they are, they can become better. And, and maybe yes. that's the idea behind it. But so you've developed this theory. Now you've recognized these things. Where does this go? What, where's the value in this? How have you utilized this either in your own career or with your own coaches? I found that um, every situation is different. And the circumstance when a coach departs either by choice or by being released, there's a culture within that team. And you kind of say, so what does that culture mean? So if you have had an empowering coach who's a friend of all the players and there's probably a little lax on the discipline and they're not doing well, sometimes they're, but they're probably talented because that's, that's what that coach could do, attract the talent. You might want to go after a coach who's the driver, who's the disciplinarian, who, who brings some sense of, uh, of uh, order to that particular group of people. 
Other times you find yourself, I remember when Bill Walsh was, was followed. I was in the Bay Area, of course, with the, when the 49ers, and they had that great run with Bill Walsh. And when they wanted to maintain what they what their, their current structure was. So Bill Walsh became, when he, when he retired from coaching, he was replaced by George Seifert, who was almost like an identical personality to Bill Walsh. And they continued, they maintained that, that consistency. And then a few years later, I think they felt like they needed to make a change. They went with Steve Mariucci, who is, who's more of a marketing type coach, because they wanted, they wanted more energy and more, more emotion in the program. So I think that's where you kind of look at things. You say, do I want to continue the success with what I've had before? Because Coach X... Uh, moved on to another position or retired from coaching by hiring someone who has a similar personality or do I feel like I need to make a change in personality because the program has not done as well as, as everyone would have hoped. And I think you find that, uh, you know, when Pete Carroll came to Seattle, then he's a marketing whiz. He's a genius in marketing. He's a very high personality guy. And, and I think he brought that energy to the Seahawks. And obviously with the, with the big championship they had, uh, it worked quite well. You know what I find interesting, one of the things that I find interesting about this is that obviously you've got coaches' personalities, but kids today are very different as well than they were maybe 20, 30 years ago. And where does that play into maybe your decision, what type of coach you want to bring in? But you've, you've got to understand how kids might respond as well, right? Or where does that play into a decision-making pro- process, thinking about these coaching types? I remember back in the 80s, we used to play seven or eight in men, men's basketball, women's basketball, we play seven or eight people per game. You can't do that anymore. I, everybody has to play. There's just, that's just one of the scenarios that you kind of have to adjust to. But I think that uh, the, the other piece is like when I, I just, I speak with recruits frequently and I say, ask a lot of questions to the recruits and the parents because you want to be a two-way street. You want the, the student athlete to come to Seattle University or whatever other institution. You want them to be happy and productive. But is that coaching style going to fit your particular area of, of, of expertise as a student athlete? Uh, do, you, do you need a driver? Do you need somebody? Do you need, do you need a discipline? And, and I think a parent sometimes is, is the best judge of that, more so than the, than the young person. So I think that everybody's kind of, you just have to kind of get a feel for, the, for the, the culture of that organization. And then with the youth today, uh, hey, I'm one of those guys that reads the newspaper every day. You know, I'm one of the few. So being over 50, and, and, and I, I've tried to adapt to all the new, the new stuff that's going on with, with uh, the high tech, the iPhone, and, and you probably have kids too, they're sitting next to each other, they're texting one another, but they, they could talk to one another. So we're not doing that as much, but I think, I also think that uh, sometimes younger coaches have that ability to communicate by the social media, which is seen to be required. And I think that, but other than that, I think, I think the coaching style kind of stays the same. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The other thing that I find curious about these coaching types is certainly team by team, you can look at what your needs are or what you want to maintain or change with with hiring a coaching type. But what about as an athletic director in charge of an entire department and establishing a culture within the department? Can different coaching types coexist within the same department culture? Fascinating. When I taught my MBA classes, I used to set, I had, I have a little uh, self-study that you fill out the form and it would kind of determine, not necessarily that you were completely a driver or a calculating or a marketer or empower, but, but you had, definitely had many of those tendencies. And so I, I would put all, all of those same groups together and say, here are your supposed strengths and weaknesses as a, as a, as a personality structure. So you'd have a group of, let's say, uh, seven or eight in each, each of the smaller groups. So they would have a project to do. Everybody had the same project. You had a project to do, but you had to do all the management skills throughout the project. What was terribly fascinating is they had to write a, a journal. And in this journal, they no, people don't buy into this right away, which is okay. Uh, it, but it, over the period of the quarter, they started facing all those things, like the drivers. There's too many people in charge. They just were. I mean, you had a group of seven. They all want to be in charge. And you know what? That doesn't work. Then the empowered were kind of like, well, no one wants to be in charge. Okay. Uh, the the cerebral calculating type, that group, they they were uh, didn't have so many great ideas, and then the market group had too many ideas. 
So those, those are just four basics. So they had to kind of recognize that amongst themselves and try to complete a, a successful project. So it was terrible. It was, I found it to be very, very interesting, and I think the students did too. So that, that was kind of fun. Yeah, well, I can imagine that it would be a puzzle that you're trying to fit <laughs> and make it all work together and keep going in the, the right direction. Is, is this something that, uh, obviously, you've done a lot in the classroom working with uh, students uh, on your theory. You know, how does this play into your day-to-day world? Is this something that you've really adopted as a part of your organizational development in your professional career? Yeah, I, what I probably try to do is, uh, and my wife of 40 years can tell you very clearly, my, my weaknesses. And I, I, she never mentions my strengths, apparently, but, but she'll tell you my weaknesses uh, regularly. And I think what I've always tried to do is, um, it, it sort of goes back to the emperor has no clothes on. Remember that old, that old story that uh, when you're behind closed doors, you need to be, you need to have people in there that disagree with you. I mean, because you there's no there's no perfect style of coaching there's no perfect style of management so what you try to do is make sure you have some sense of balance and so uh, for me I probably need somebody that's really really organized and meticulous because I am not so so I I I recognize that in, my, in myself but I also try to build people around me and I've been very fortunate uh, a lot of times when I've, I've only had three jobs my my entire eight athletic director career but each place I've gone I've, I've thoroughly enjoy the people that were already there and I think it was sometimes you sort of look across and you, you find devotion and dedication and passion in what they're doing so I've been fortunate in that regard but I also recognize that that you know that I'm not perfect in every every stage of, of the management of an athletic department and I need people who can complement my own my own personality well, this is very interesting and fascinating to me as somebody who always appreciated organizational development, and, and I think that there's so much more here. We've only scratched the surface, and, and I know what we talked about doing is making some of your materials available along sure. with this post, so we'll make sure that people have access to that because I think it is a, a very interesting study on the world of college athletics and, in particular, coaching styles, and, and mm-hmm. I think a lot people could get a lot out of it, so I appreciate you sharing your thoughts there. Glad to do so. So I want to transition now. As we look at the world of college athletics today, there's a lot going on, especially at the Division I level with reform and, and everything else that people are talking about. And there's BCS and FCS schools, and then there's the non-football playing schools. And, you know, there's probably a lot of nervousness out there. But whatever the situations may be, leadership uh, is always in question, whether it's the leaders of the NCAA or institutions as presidents or chancellors or athletic directors, certainly. And, and so I think leadership plays into the future of college athletics in a big way. I'm curious, as you think about the future of athletics and you think about leadership, what what do you think is important as, as things move forward? When you think about leadership, skills, traits, or abilities, what's important to you and, and how does that translate into the future of athletics? Well, one of the people I admire the most is Kevin White. Uh, uh, he's currently the athletic director at Duke and uh, he and I went to St. Joseph College. He and I and his wife, Jane, actually went to St. Joseph College uh, you know, 40 years ago, or a well, long time ago, back in the <laughs> 70s. But I, I just admired his career and how he handles, how he just deals with all the leaders of factions. And you just kind of look at, at, at the, the, the people, and probably the biggest thing that's changed is that um, I think the legal and, and budgeting issues are prominent these days. I, I think that you have to be really creative because the market's changing drastically. We just had a meeting yesterday where we're trying to figure out, we're playing the arena, which is a beautiful, the, where the Sonics used to play. We're trying to figure out how we, how we get our students to come to the game. And then, but while they're at the game, give them things to do during a game on their iPhones and all that, all that, the, the, the social internet stuff. So, we're trying to be, I think you have to really be creative these days. I think you have to be much younger, uh, figure out what that generation, uh, the millennials, I think we refer to them uh, right now, but uh, how do they how do they match up with the baby boomers that, that I was a part of? And, and I think mostly it's just being empathic and, and trying to understand the customer base and the fan base in a way that's unique to them. Uh, in the Northwest, you know, we're, we're pretty well known to be a little bit passive aggressive. That's that's what the understanding is. In the Midwest, it's pretty conservative. 
in the southeast, it's you know there's a different level there than in the northeast. Every part of the country has its own its own personality quirk. So I think the biggest thing is just uh, I called it Beyond Theory Why. Beyond Theory Why was a McGregor uh, theory back in the managerial books. It goes way way back in the '60s, I think. But Beyond Theory Why was you mask the task at hand with the personality style or the management style. So whatever the task, so if I'm a, if I'm on the assembly line, if that's part of my responsibility, and, and that that's that iPhone needs to work every single time, that takes a specific type of manager versus someone trying to find a cure for AIDS, where it's, or, or the Bill guy, I just heard Bill Gates the other day uh, on, on one of the lectures here in Seattle, and it, it just, the, the energy that all those, those young Microsoft people went through, that had nothing to do with a, a driver style. That was just, just letting these very talented people feel empowered. So, so I think most of it is is trying to understand uh, the culture of the organization that you're part of and what that organization needs. Does it need the driver to make sure every part is perfect, or does it need uh, a lot of non-management so that people of talent can really excel? And I think that I find that to be the most important uh, or characteristics. And and that makes sense. Is it that you're talking about a self-awareness being a key component to your own leadership? Yeah, and I think we have to admit our our frailties. And uh, but some of the market, I think you probably recognize. I mean, what drives some of us is our ego. I mean, uh, we all have big egos, and sometimes we don't want to admit that we have we have the weaknesses. And and uh, uh, you know, I I know that I still, even though I've been doing this for thirty years, there's still a lot of areas I need to improve on a lot. So. I think self-awareness and self-analyst and, and really, I think, make sure that you have people around the room that just aren't yes people. Yeah. Uh, it's, I've, seen that, um, I've seen that fail when, when you just have people disagree with the, uh, the person in charge all the time. And uh, that just seems, it, it seems that, well, first of all, it's, it's very, pretty stagnant if you think about it. And secondly, uh, the emperor does, sometimes the emperor doesn't have any clothes on. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, it's, that's good advice, and I appreciate your comments on that. Related to that, I, as I always uh, talk with guests about uh, giving advice for up-and-comers, there are literally hundreds now of graduate programs in athletic administration, <laughs> sports administration, what have you, and these kids are graduating, hoping to get jobs, and there's actually far more graduates than there are actual jobs, and everybody's looking for some advantage. So I'm sure you have these conversations all the time with students. What advice do you have for somebody that's looking to break into collegiate athletics, no matter what the level? What What do you say to them to kind of help keep them motivated or focused or give them uh, some sort of advantage? The biggest issue, I think, uh, is that where you want to land, you should start there. Uh, the old days of working away from high school to junior college to Division three Division, I don't think those occur anymore, especially when it comes to football. Uh, FBS big time football is a is a unique opportunity for for many. But I think if I was a young person starting out and I wanted to end up being at a big football school, I would start there as a volunteer or as a part time something, anything to get my foot in the door. Versus going to a a a, uh, a Seattle University, a one triple A school where they don't have football. But I think that's an important distinction to make. The second piece is, what level do you want to end up? There's a, I mean, I love my years at St. Joe College in, in rural Indiana, and uh, but that for that period of time, I mean, that that was important to me. Now I moved on there from there, obviously. But but when you're young, when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and you just started your career, or you're in a master's program. What what feels good to you? Does it, you want to be at Pacific Lutheran or uh, Seattle Pacific University, which are both really good institutions here in the Northwest? Or do you want to be at the University of Washington or Washington State? So I think I would make those decisions earlier, you know, if you can, because you just and then because it's just it's just more difficult to move up than than in the old days. And then the other piece would be uh, if you go through your internships, basically you're either a manager or marketer. I mean, the management side is going to be uh, your accounting, your your academic compliance, your uh, student athlete welfare. Uh, business operations, all those things are on the on the management side. On the marketing side, you're going to have sports information, uh, sales, donors, uh, promotions. So you, you have kind of, I would try to experience both of those as an internship. Like if you have supposed to do two of them, try one of both and, and try to, because you don't know. You know, you think you know, but you really don't know yet. So having that experience of, of those two sides, then, then then focusing probably on one or the other and, and, make, and making that your, your career goal. 
That makes a lot of sense. And, and on a related note, as you sit in your chair and you're considering hiring somebody, whether it's mm-hmm. for a senior associate AD position or something below that, are there things that you look for in candidates? Are there things that you think really set people apart or are important in the people that you bring into your department? The two things. One, I always look at their extracurricular activities. And, and I've, I've got this... Uh, this, this one item I've noticed uh, on the person's resume that's been 100% accurate with involved in Special Olympics. And so I look for things like that. And, and just what do they do in outside? Because so many times the resumes, the GPAs, all that are pretty much the same. Uh, the, second, the second piece would probably be that you'd like to find someone who already did what you're asking them to do on a successful level. Uh, for example, we're a smaller staff. We have about 70 people. We're at the University of Washington. I think it's probably you know, 200 or something like that. So, so where the, how does how does all that fit in with your with the overall managing style? And does that person have that opportunity? Because uh, I've been at Catholic universities my entire career. That there's there's a culture that you kind of get uh, involved with there. And will that person fit into that culture? They may be highly qualified for the job that you have. I used to say it this way. Do you want a job or this job? You know, to the applicant. What, what? Are you just applying for a job, or is there something? Make make me believe that you're applying for the job I have available right now at this time. And I, I think that tends to separate the, the sheep from the goats or the the yin from the yang or whatever that is. <laughs> whatever they say in Indiana, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm still a Hoosier, probably. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I don't obviously want to come off as an expert because. Sometimes you just get lucky, and I've, I've had those moments when you, you end up with a coach who didn't fit any particular style. It is coming, they just win like crazy. I still remember, uh, I will say this, uh, I remember that Bill Walsh, Bill Walsh basically was having difficulty getting a head coaching job in the NFL. He's probably one of the top five coaches of all time, top ten, depending on who you're talking to, but he interviewed poorly, okay? He, that was the story on him. He was one of those, the calculating types that just, wasn't very charismatic and just didn't have a lot of energy in his conversation. And, and, and so I think sometimes administrators, we get caught up in how the interview went, you know, and, and the, how did he come across or how did she come across? Oh, she was this and that. And then sometimes it's the person that's the quiet one off to the side that can really get the job done. So that probably one thing I like to add to the conversation, but uh, hey, I really enjoyed this. I, I hope that it was helpful. And and as we mentioned, if there's anybody like me to have more conversation about this whole theory stuff, and if they want to add something to it, because I'm open to criticism, as, as we all are, and, and trying to develop, because ultimately, I do think this, that anybody in the sports leadership field, selecting the head coach is probably the most important thing we can do. And the more money that's involved with that, as you move up Division One. Triple A, Division One, Double A, Division One, FBS, then all that stuff. When you move up to that level, that decision becomes even more critical. And I think having more tools in the toolbox, so to speak, that can help you, that can help people develop, is, is important. Yeah. So. Well, this has been a great conversation, Bill. I mean, obviously, years of experience. You've seen a lot. You've done a lot. And really appreciate you sharing all your comments with us today. And I hope at some point in the future you'll come back and chat with us again. Love to. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the time. Great. Well, this has been Perspective on Athletics with Bill Hogan, Director of Athletics at Seattle University.